If we want to reach our city for Jesus Christ, CCV cannot be the only church in our city that's growing and taking ground. You know what needs to happen? We need to see multiple hundreds of churches in our city taking ground and growing and reaching people for Jesus Christ. If we want to reach our city for Jesus Christ, it requires, say it out loud with me with everything you got, more than us. We started in a movie theater uh, just about five years ago. But being in a movie theater, it, it's a lot of work. They said, do you need like a new sound system? Do you need this? I go, we need a building, guys. Just over the past four weeks of being in here, we've baptized 14 people. We baptized four people just a few weeks ago, and that fourth person was our 100th baptism as a church. Just this last Sunday, we had more people than chairs in the worship center. And we're at the place now where we know our goal is to make space to make disciples. This is gonna mean for us building a new facility for worship for children. It's gonna be about 10,000 square feet. It's gonna more than double our seating capacity. We are on fire. This is what we say we believe in, and we're doing it together. Oh, gosh. Well, if you're new to CCV, you just need to know uh, we're a church that wants to live a radically generous life, and we want it to be about more than us. It has to be. And if you were with us last Christmas, as you saw from that uh, summary of More Than Us, the video that happened, God worked a miracle in our midst, and we raised over $6 million, and here's the best part of it all. We didn't keep one penny, 100% of what was raised went to help other churches grow and reach more people for Jesus so together we can transform our valley for Jesus Christ and that's because of your generosity. So can we just celebrate what God did one more time through more than us? We wanna, we wanna keep you updated on all the great things that God is doing with that program. Well, I've told you many times that when we plan out a series uh, what we're gonna teach on, it's normally happens, we plan what we're gonna teach about a year in advance. So last August, we planned the series that we're gonna be in right now called Don't Take the Bait. But last August, we had no idea what 2020 was gonna bring, but God did. And he was going in front of us. He's always planning exactly what we need. Because during the series, Don't Take the Bait, what we're gonna talk about is how to live free from the trap of offense. Now think about that. Is it anybody else feel like 2020 has been the year of being offended? Does anybody else feel like this? Is it not amazing what's happened this year? I mean, let me, let me just ask it this way. Has there ever been a year in your lifetime where this has happened? There's been a global pandemic that created an economic meltdown while there's social unrest and riots happening across cities all across America in the middle of an election year, which means what from all this? It means that all your vacations and plans got canceled. They did. And you know, your kids are stuck at home driving you nuts while you have to work from home. And then listen, you can't make this up. In the middle of the hottest summer on record in Arizona. How? How? You know? And in, in the midst of all this, you get on social media and you see all the crazy and just crazy stuff people are posting on social media. Has anybody else been offended in 2020? All right. I'll just be personal, okay? I don't think I've had a year where I've been more offended. And so I think this series is as much for me as it is anybody in our whole entire church. But I really believe that God is gonna use this series to transform our lives. Because what you're gonna see as we look at scripture on this topic is this, is that of all the ways Satan can destroy you, and he's out to destroy your life, the trap of offense may be his most hidden and sneaky weapon. Why is that true? 
One, it's impossible not to be offended. And you're gonna see that even from Jesus says that. But even if you escape one offense, the creative ways you can get baited into being offended again, the creative ways are endless. I mean, just think about all the ways you've been offended, even in just the past week or the past month. I mean, you looked at a post on social media. You saw some political commentary on TV. You saw some you know, comment from your spouse or a coworker. You were driving along the road and somebody did something. You walked in the grocery store and met a Karen. Anybody did that recently, you know? <laughs> if you're like, what's a Karen? Yeah, Google it, all right? I mean, it's like, you just get so offended, right? I'm writing this message on Monday. I leave the office around five, pick up my family, and we go to eat at In-N-Out because we love In-N-Out hamburger. That's like, we love it. Anybody else love In-N-Out? So I, I roll up to In-N-Out. We're going through the drive-thru, and the In-N-Out I go to, there's two lines uh, at the drive-thru, and then they merge into one line as you get to the, the window. And everybody knows in the universe what happens when there's two lines that merge, what you do, right? When you get there, you take turns. Person on the right goes, person on the left goes. This is a universal law of the universe. Everybody knows it, right? <laughs> and so I'm in the left lane. The person in the right, we're both at the front. He goes, it's my turn to go, and the guy behind him decides to ride his bumper and not let me in. And you know what I'm thinking? You jerk! I mean, I'm so offended. I'm like, you just broke a law that God put in place. Everybody takes turns. I wanted to get out of my car as a man of the cloth and lay some holy hands on that man and like show him, you know? I mean, I'm, so, I'm just you know, I'm like, it's impossible. You know this from your life. It's impossible to live sometimes not fall prey to this trap of offense. Now, why would I call it a trap? Because throughout scripture, that's the word Jesus uses. But look, watch this. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus is talking to his disciples about how to live the life he wants for them, how to produce fruit in their life. And in Luke chapter 17, watch what Jesus tells his disciples. Then he said to his disciples, it's impossible that no offenses should come. It's impossible that you're gonna live your life and not be offended. Some translations say it's bound to come. It's going to happen. But the word Jesus uses here for offense is so descriptive, and it's the word that's used throughout the New Testament, not only by Jesus, but, but some of the other writers of the New Testament. And watch what the word offense means. Offense in the Greek is this word scandalon. Just say that out loud with me, scandalon. Here's what it means. It's the bait that triggers a trap to close when the animal touches it. A bait is, a trap is set, bait is put in it, and when an animal touches the bait, the trap closes, and why do you set a trap? There's only two reasons, primarily. One is to kill something, two is, or to cage it. Which means when you take the bait of an offense, it's Satan's way to try to kill you and destroy you or to cage you, to hold you back from all the goodness that God wants in your life. Is that not an amazing word picture that Jesus wants us to have? And I started thinking about the idea of a trap. And think about how creative we are as humans at creating traps to, to trap things. And what we know is that Genesis chapter three says Satan is more creative and crafty than any of us. So I started thinking about that and I thought, well, let's look at how, how many traps we've been creative with. You know, I mean, you have the classic mouse trap, you take the, take the cheese and like, you're done, right, okay? You get the glue traps, you know, that are scented with peanut butter, stick in there, you're, you're gone. You have these ant traps where you take one piece of bait back to the colony, whole colony's dead, right? You got the zapper, anybody remember the zapper here? It's like it's 4,000 volts, it lights up, they just go in, they're done. How many times, do, how many things have we created, like little you know, fishing lures? We have thousands of them that we create to try to bait in fish. We even have these nets they put out that when a fish or some other um, you know, crab or anything gets, comes in here, they cannot get out. They're stuck. I mean, anybody else remember this from your childhood, the finger trap? <laughs> some of you have like nightmares from this because someone said, just put your finger on this side, put your finger on that side, and you were a little kid and you're like, huh. Mommy, I can't, you know, you're like, you couldn't get out, right? But the image I want you to have in your head throughout this series when it comes to a trap 
is I want you to think about a bear trap. Now, this is an actual bear trap, but I asked our team to get one that actually opened because I wanted to try to set it off on stage. But apparently, a bear trap that opens is illegal, so you're not even able to get those nowadays. So this is what we've got, all right? And it's closed, but you can see the teeth. You can see how deadly and damaging this would be. And what a bear trap's designed to do is they set the bait for the bear right here, and when it's set on the ground and connected to something, when a bear goes by, if he takes the bait, I don't care how big the bear is, I don't care how strong the bear is, those jaws, those teeth will clamp down and he is done. And what I want you to understand is that it doesn't matter how strong you think you are, how big you think you are and important you think you are, when you take the bait of being offended, it's Satan's way of absolutely destroying your life. Why is offense so destructive? Why would it be a trap that Satan uses to destroy you or cage you? If you're taking notes, you should write this down. Anytime you hold on to an offense, you grab the bait, you put bitterness in your heart automatically. And I wanna say it's stronger so it sinks into someone's heart here today. Holding on to an offense allows bitterness to sink its fangs into your heart. Bitterness. Just play along across all of our campuses. How many of you know someone who's bitter? Just raise, raise your hand. You know a person that's bitter. If you're not raising your hand, you might be the person that's bitter. <laughs> we all know someone, I think. You know, and, and what I want to tell you is if you know someone that's bitter, if you could dig, if it was possible for you to dig a little bit in their life, what you would find almost always is they are holding on to an offense, a hurt in their past. They took the bait and now it's trapped them. And here's the problem. There's no win in being bitter. There's no win in living offended. You'll never meet anyone that says, you know what, I'm better because I'm bitter. I'm so happy because I let bitterness into my heart. And yet it, it happens to us. I mean, I've had seasons in my life where I've taken the bait and I've let bitterness in. I, I remember it, I mean, I, so many times, but I've shared with you, Jamie and I, when we first got married, how, how difficult our early marriage years were, they really were, and I've been very open about that and taught you on, on, on when we talk about marriage. And one of the things that happened in our marriage is that when, right after we got married, my parents went through a really bitter divorce and being the adult child, you know, you, you're kind of involved in, in that divorce process. And I got so offended by some things that happened in the midst of that. And I took the bait and I let bitterness in. And bitterness does not just affect you. It affects everyone around you. And it began affecting our marriage because the bitterness was leaking out of me. I'd taken the bait. And I had to learn to release this bitterness to get my hand out of the trap. And the great news I want you to know today is there is a way for us to not take the bait. And it's so important to learn because listen, no bitter person has ever changed the world. And what you need to know, what you need to know is this is God's plans for your future are too big for you to hold on to an offense from your past. Let me say it again. God's plans for your future in your life, your calling, it's so big. God wants to do so much through you. It's too big to you to hold on to an offense from the past and not be able to allow God to do what he wants to do through your life. And there is a way to not take the bait. And even when you get trapped, there's a way to be released. And it's gonna be a journey we're gonna walk through for the next four weeks. You have to be here every single weekend, but today, I wanna just start by talking about how do we overcome small offenses? How do we overcome small offenses? Think about all the small ways you've been offended, just even recently. I mean, a coworker said something, again, you read something on social media, you were driving on the road. Can we get really real today? Men, has this ever happened to you? You know, it's late at night, and you're, your wife's laying next to you, and you, you, you look over her, and you give her the look. And you even said something smooth. You're like, girl, you look so good. And you know where you want this to go, right? And what happens sometimes? Does she sometimes, mean she just lays over? Or she says something like, oh, honey, I'm just so tired. You ever been there, married? And nervous laughter. We've all been there. Come on, you've been there. 
Ladies, has he ever promised to do something and it just doesn't get done? And you ask him over and over and over and over and over again and you just get offended? Come on, singles that are here today? Singles, you ever been dating someone and they just, just ghosted you, never texted you back? Singles, you ever had someone ask you, why don't you have a boyfriend or girlfriend? And you're thinking, you shut your face, you know? <laughs> I mean, you ever been offended? Parents, have you ever felt like your child is not getting a fair shake from a teacher or a coach? The ways we can get offended are endless. And yet, what we're gonna see is that avoiding an offense is impossible, but living offended is a choice, and you can choose not to live offended. I wanna hone in on one verse today that's just gonna help give one piece of advice on how you can make a choice to not live offended. If you turn to Proverbs chapter 19, this is the wisdom book. It drops just wisdom into our laps all the time. In this book, in chapter 19, verse 11, we get this amazing piece of advice. Listen to this. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. A person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to do what with an offense? Say it out loud. To overlook an offense. A person's wisdom yields patience. It's the one's glory to overlook an offense. I wanna break this verse down for you. I think the first thing we we learn is not everyone overlooks an offense. Only the wisest people do. What? It's it's a person's wisdom. The wise people overlook offenses. And in, in your life, my guess is the wisest people you know are people that don't get offended really easily. In my life, I work with one of our pastors in my inner circle. His name's Tony and and. He's one of the most respected people on our whole entire staff and one of the reasons why he's one of the most least offended people I've ever worked around in my life. I bet you the same is true of you. The second thing we learn from this verse is when you overlook an offense, it's to, what's it say? It says it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. And this word is so descriptive. It means to become magnificent. You wanna be magnificent in this world? Magnificent people overlook offenses, and you know it. Because if you studied the heroes in our day and age, the heroes that we look up to, almost all of them have the same thing in common. They've had to overlook offenses, and they did it really, really well. Can I give you a perfect example? On Friday was Jackie Robinson Day. And there may be no better example in our lifetime of a man who has become heroic in our midst, number 42, the most famous number in all of baseball, one of the greatest heroes of all time, Jackie Robinson, a follower of Jesus. What did he do? He stepped on a baseball field and every single day he took the most vile racial slurs, the most worst things you could ever say to another human being were coming his way from the stands and from other players. Players would slide into him, try to break his ankles. They cut him with their cleats all the time. And what did Jackie Robinson do every single day? He stepped up and he rose above the offense. He kept overlooking the offenses. And that is why he is heroic today. That is why he's magnificent. You can't be magnificent unless you learn to overlook an offense. What does it mean to overlook an offense? What's that word mean? To overlook an offense means to pass over or step over it. It's the Hebrew word abar. It's literally what it means. Let me just give you the visual. In your life, you're gonna walk along the path of your life and you're gonna come upon a huge trap that Satan sets for you when you get offended by something and you have a choice. You can stick your hand in and take the bait and get trapped or you can abar, you can step over the offense. That's literally what it means to step over or to pass around. When, on social media, when someone rips you to shreds, you can take the bait and respond and say, you are the stupidest person I know. You just obliterate them back. Or you can simply step it over, step over it. Or respond in love. In your marriage, with a coworker, you can step over an offense. And here's what some of you are thinking, and I know it, why? Because I can read your mind. You're thinking this, Ashley, that seems so weak. I don't, I just step over it. I don't, res- I don't like give it back to them. I don't give them a piece of my mind. That's so weak. Well, since we're talking about weakness, let me reframe it for you. When you understand an offense is a deadly trap that's designed to destroy your life, who's the weak one? The one that passes over this massive trap or the one that reaches his hand in and gets trapped and destroyed. Who's the weak one? 
The weak one's the one who reaches in. The strong one is the one who steps over an offense. And that is so convicting to me because I know how many times in my own life I've reached in and taken the bait. I know it. And what I want to say to someone here today is you don't have to take the bait. You know, I think about my own life and my leadership. You know, being a leader, sometimes you get the most vile, nasty, accusative emails or letters or posts on social media. And I understand as a leader, not everyone understands what I see or the seat I'm in, and, and they don't understand every decision. But sometimes it's so vile, it's so nasty. And in my younger leadership years, I would have always responded. I would have always taken the bait. And I've just learned that there's so much strength and magnificence in leadership and not taking the bait, just stepping over it. And I wanna speak to a leader here today. I wanna tell you this, you don't always have to defend yourself. When I teach on leadership, I'll often give leaders this principle that I believe is 100% true. It's this, your friends don't need an answer and your enemies won't believe you no matter what you say. Is that good? Your friends who know you, who trust you, you don't have to give them an answer. And your enemies won't believe you no matter what you say. Now I'm not saying don't ever respond, I'm just saying if you respond, do so in a worthy, honorable manner and lead with love. That's what makes you magnificent. And it's, so, it's kind of easier said than done, isn't it? It's why we need another piece of advice from scripture and that is that to step over an offense, you often have to close the gap with love. You have to assume the best. An offense opens a gap in your life. There's a gap that exists, and the trap is set, and you have to figure out how to cover that trap and step over it, and the way scripture tells us to do that is often to cover the trap with love. Watch what Proverbs says. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. When you get offended, you have one of two options of how you respond to that person. You can accuse, you can assume the worst about someone when you feel offended by them, or you can lead with love, which is to assume the best about someone and their intentions. Let me ask, what do you normally lead with when you feel offended? I have so much work to do here. I oftentimes lead this way. My wife is incredible, she's so much better at this than me. She will lead with the best of assumptions and I am really working on leading with better assumptions, leading with love. When that person cuts you off on the freeway, you can either accuse, which by the way in Revelations it says Satan, one of his names is he's the accuser, he wants you to accuse others, where God is love. So when you get cut off on the freeway, you have one or two options. You can say, that person's the neo-Nazi communist, you know, I hope he goes home and gets food poisoning, you know, I don't know. Or you can lead with love and you can say, you know what, maybe he's on his way to something really important, like his wife is delivering in a hospital, maybe he has a sick child in the car. Have you ever cut someone off when you've been in a hurry for something important? Oh, I'm gonna lead with love. When your coworker is so rude to you, you can say, you're the worst. Or you can, or you can lead with love. Maybe something's going on in their life at home with their marriage or their kids and I don't even know. And, if they're just having a really rough day, I'm gonna lead, I'm gonna cover that with love. It allows me to step over it easier. Let's get real again. Men, when she says, I'm tired tonight, you can assume she's so lazy and doesn't love me at all. <laughs> or you could assume, you know what? She's had the roughest day. She's exhausted. Now, ladies, this is just for free, okay? This is for free for you. I'm gonna I'm all this in. This isn't even part of the message. But when you say, hey, I'm just tired, you know what would go a long ways to help you win is if you said, but tomorrow night or this night, it'd be awesome. That would help you win in a big way, all right? And I, that's just free of charge today, all right? Free of charge. But do you lead with love or do you lead with assuming the worst? Can I tell you one of the number one traits of every healthy marriage Every healthy relationship is it's two people who are posturing themselves to always assume the best. That's what makes a dynamic, godly marriage. And it's kind of hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Which is why we need to be reminded what an offense really looks like, what it really is. It's a trap to bait you. 
Now, if you're in an abusive relationship, I'm not talking about that, you run. I'm talking about the small offenses that come in our lives. And I don't know if God's speaking to someone here today, like he's been speaking to me writing this, but I want you to know this, your life is too short. Your calling is so big. And God's plans for you are huge, too big to hold on to a small offense from the past. And I'm writing this message and I, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to take the bait. Literally just this week. It happens so often. And what happened to me is I married a couple years ago and what you need to understand about me is I just don't ever get to do weddings. My schedule does not allow it. And so if I do a wedding for someone, you have to understand that it has to be a really close relationship, someone I'm really, really invested in. And I did this wedding. I cratered my family for a week to do this wedding because I wanted to pour into this couple that we love so much. And I found out just recently that this man is leaving his wife right after they had a newborn son. And that's not the offense. The offense came to me when I began to reach out in love and said, hey, I just want, let me, let me call you, let me text me, call me back. I just want to, I want to pour into you, call me, call me. And I finally got a response after like a week of, of like texting. He said, I'll call you tomorrow night. Awesome, tomorrow night came and went, nothing, crickets. I texted him the next day, hey, I didn't hear from you, call, you know, well, maybe something happened, like call, call me back, I'll call you. No calls, no text backs, ghosted. And I'm getting so offended I'm like, you think I have time to text you every single day asking, hey, reach out, please, please reach out. I'm getting so offended. And then I was praying in my prayer time on Monday morning and I just had this moment where I said, God, would you help me understand what he's going through? And God impressed, impressed immediately on me three things. He said, Ashley, you have no idea how this man's hurting. He is so overwhelmed from shame. And two, He's so overwhelmed, he's paralyzed. He's paralyzed every single day not knowing what to do. And three is he's utterly afraid. He's afraid of all the implications of what's happening in his family, but most of all, he's afraid of what this means for his newborn son and how his son's gonna view his dad. And when I understood that, I realized something. I had just been thinking about me and my offense. I wasn't thinking about what he was going through. It doesn't excuse him not getting back to me, but when you can see it this way, it allows you to cover the offense with love. And I begin to assume more of love and I can cover it and step over it, why? Because my calling is too big to hold on to an offense from the past. And so is yours. Proverbs 19, 11, what's it tell us? A person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. There's one phrase I didn't cover with you, and it's this phrase right here. It's a person's wisdom yields patience. You know what this word and this phrase, this idiom in Hebrew means? It means to be long-nosed, to be long in the face. You say, what does that mean? We are told universally that when you get mad and bitter and upset and offended, the telltale sign is what? In your face. Blood rushes to your face, your nostrils, uh, Flare, you ever seen this in your marriage before? You know, in a marriage, you're not so afraid, you go. <sighs> this is saying to be long in the nostrils, which means it takes a long time for you to really get upset. You don't get offended easily, you keep stepping over it. You ever met someone who you thought their face looked gentle, they had gentle eyes? They were long in the face, long in the nose. When I was studying this, there was one person's uh, picture that came to my mind. There's a pastor on our staff named Ben Gal. His dad, his name is Dick, and this is a picture of his face. And I just want you to show it, show it to you because this is his granddaughter, but he's one of the most gentle faces I've ever been around. I've never seen him get upset or be offended. So gentle. And you're thinking, well, that's because he's probably always been that way. I mean, he's probably a little simple, you know? I mean, he's probably not really driven, hasn't really had to go through anything hard in life like me and you'd be dead wrong. Ben would say this, he would say some of his earliest memories as a child are watching his dad and mom be so offended and angry, they're screaming, yelling, throwing things in the house. Ben said as a four year old, my, one of my earliest memories is being in the basement next to our air hockey table, my parents are fighting and it's just vicious, my dad picks up his sandwich and he 
throws it up against the wall and it explodes everywhere. And as a young four-year-old, he goes, I just sat there and was stunned. I didn't even know what to do. How does he go from that to being so long-faced, so gentle? Ben's dad and mom found Jesus. And Jesus began to transform their hearts and as they stayed connected to Jesus, the fruits of the Spirit started coming out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And what Ben's dad began to realize is that he wasn't the only one being offended in the relationship. He was being an offender as well. And they both began to overstep the offenses and realize that it's not important to be right. It's important to keep the relationship together. And I was just thinking about this week, thinking what was at stake in Ben's life if his dad had not overcome and his mom had not overcome their bitterness from the offenses in their relationship? What would Ben be today? And many of you, that's your story. You come from a household where there was so much bitterness and so much offense and nobody stepped over it. Everybody took it, everybody took the bait. And I wanna tell you that you can be the one that changes your family's legacy. When you begin to step over the offenses and not let bitterness, the fangs of bitterness that seep into your heart, why? Because your marriage, your family, your career, your life, God has such big plans for you. It's too big for you to hold on to an offense from the past. You can't take the bait. You have to step over it. Now we're gonna go on a journey throughout this series. And we're gonna go deeper in the weeks to come to learn really how to do this well. But today I wanna end with a challenge for you. And here's the challenge. One is I want you to name something right now that you're offended by. And be specific and be honest. You're only as good as you are honest. What are you offended by? Who's offended you? What's the name? Who, what picture pops in your mind? What event? And I'm gonna challenge you to do something that sounds simple, but it's very hard, but by the power of Jesus living inside of you, you can do it. I'm gonna ask you to decide to step over it, to step over the offense, to not take the bait, to get over it. And if you would do that, you would begin to see God Work a miracle in your life as he releases the bitterness and allows you to go into the future he has for you. That's what I want for you. It's what God wants for you. It's what you want for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just the advice that you give us in scripture. You prepared us in Luke chapter 17. You said it's impossible not to be offended. It's coming your way. And yet you gave us the wisdom, God, of what to do with those offenses. And in Proverbs 19, Father, you gave us this very specific advice that it's the wisest people in the world, the people who wanna be magnificent, they learn to step over, to overlook an offense. And Father, I pray for the man or woman here today that whether it's a marriage, something that happened in their marriage in the past or even this week, or if it's something that's happened with a, a family member or maybe a friend that betrayed them or maybe a coworker that took an idea and just financially ruin them. I don't know what it is, but for someone here today, Father, would you help us overlook, to step over these offenses because God, your plans for us are too big for us to be holding on to an offense from the past. Work in our lives, Father. Do what you do. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, before you leave today, I wanna give you one last thing, one last challenge, and that is, if you're not a part of a CCV small group, I wanna challenge you to get into a group today. We're going through this series, Don't Take the Bait. We have additional material in the small group environments, which is so good, and I don't know how you can truly overcome offenses without having other good people around you, so you can go to our website, you can text groups to 72020, you can go on our mobile app. We have a group finder, has a group for you, near you. You need to get in it. You have zero excuses. Get into a group. And this week, CCB, listen, don't take the bait. Have a great weekend, everybody.